Good morning. Since the staff that usually do, does equipping hour went into interplanetary travel and landed in Jupiter this morning, uh, it leaves someone that stayed on Earth to do the equipping hour this morning, so it happens to fall to me this time. I uh, want to, I titled what I'm going to give the great and wonderful love of God. And probably like I, when I was preaching, I, I always felt like I was preaching above my understanding. And that's certainly the case this morning. So uh, we'll, we'll get started here. It's a topic that surpasses our understanding. And it's something that the Apostle Paul prays that saints will come to know the love of God. And the inspiration for the title comes from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, the, uh, the uh, first part of the verse. It says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. The title... Uh, Martin, Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he was uh, dealing with this passage in 1 John, wrote the following. I suppose we must agree that nothing more sublime than this has ever been written, and any man who has to preach upon such a text or upon such a word must be unusually conscious of his own smallness and inadequacy and unworthiness. Uh, any man, uh, let's see, God's tendency, or one's tendency with a statement like this always is just to stand in wonder and amazement at it. I have never chosen in and of myself to preach upon this text. I have often felt that I would like to, but there are certain great words like this in Scripture of which, frankly, I am in a sense frightened, frightened as a preacher, lest anything that I say may detract from them or rob anyone of the greatness and their glory. This may be wrong, but this is how it always affects me. And I guess if it affected Martin Lloyd-Jones that way, I, I shouldn't feel bad if it affects me that way. So let's uh, bow in prayer and then we'll get into the lesson. Our Heavenly Father, you've told us that your love surpasses our understanding and yet it's your will that we come to know your love. I pray that as we look at this word about what your love is, that we, you would help me to convey the truth, help us to all grow in the grace and knowledge of you, and may your name be glorified because of what you've revealed to us in your word. May it result in a greater love for you, a greater love for others. Bring our lives together for the greater glory of your name. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, 1 John 3, 1 through 3 will guide our thinking. At least it will be a rough outline for us. And I'll read this passage at this time. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. John is directing the readers to take a look at and notice how great the love is which the Father has bestowed on us. Grasping what it means to be loved by God has a direct bearing on the way we live. The word how great is used only a few places in scripture, the Greek word for that. It was uh, used by the apostles when, uh, they, uh, when, when they pointed out to Jesus the uh, stones in the building, they said, See what, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings, what wonderful was used to translate that word for how great. It was also used when Jesus calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. After 
it calmed, he, they said, what kind of man is this? They were observing that Jesus was no ordinary man. Then uh, when Peter wrote to the believers who were anticipating the coming of the kingdom of God in which dwells righteousness, he said, what sort of people, what sort is the word there, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? We should be a special kind of people in a fallen world because we are citizens of a future unfallen world. The kind of love which the Father has given us is great and it's wonderful and the origin of the word actually can convey the idea that it's out of this world. It may not seem so great to people who have the idea that man is basically good to call them children of God. They do that all the time. But when we understand the scripture, reveal, what it reveals about man, his natural condition, and about the character of God, we begin to understand that it would be love beyond anything in this world to, for, for God to call man his children. To begin with, man is not basically good. Jesus said that there is no one who does good but God. And Romans 3.12 12 says, All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Romans 5, 6 says that we were helpless when Jesus died for us. This means that there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. Man is sinful and he falls short of the glory of God. Man's sin has alienated him from God. It has created an enmity between God and man. And by nature, we're dead in our sins, which means that we're unable to respond to God. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. Men by his own wisdom cannot come to know God. He has no interest in knowing him and he's unable to do so. The only way a man can come to know the things of the Spirit of God is for God to reveal them to him. That is why on one occasion, Jesus greatly rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and he said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. Remember that Jesus said to Peter after he confessed, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Man's depraved condition is one part of the obstacle of man becoming children of God. The other part is God's nature. God is not only loving and kind, he is also righteous and too holy to look upon sin. God's holy nature requires him to have a righteous indignation against our sin and it alienates us from him. His holy wrath against sin requires that sin must be punished. That wrath against our, son, our sin must be satisfied before our sin can be forgiven or we can even become children of God. Many people try to do something to pacify God in order to be accepted by him. God cannot be appeased by anything that man can do. It, that's like offering filthy rags to him in order to gain acceptance. Isaiah 64, 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. God's love caused him to provide a solution to the alienation between God and man. And here is how Paul describes it. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for, our, for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would even dare, dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said that greater love has no one than this, 
that one lay down his life for his friends. It's amazing that he would call people like us his friends. Listen to John's description of God's provision for us. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Greek word translated propitiation carries the idea of a means of appeasing. When Jesus was crucified, his death completely appeased or satisfied the wrath of God against our sin. He could freely forgive the sins of a believer in Jesus without violating his own righteousness and his own justice because justice had been met at the cross. Just before Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. As he hung on the cross during those three hours of darkness, he experienced the wrath of God, the Father, against our sins. He experienced the penalty that would have that we would have had to bear for our sins had he not done this. For the time of his existence, he uh, experienced being forsaken for the time of his uh, hanging on the cross. He knew what it was to be forsaken of God by the very Father who loved him. And surely our griefs, Isaiah says, he bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And then continuing on in Isaiah 53, he says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As the result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Paul described what happened when Jesus died on the cross as follows. He, God, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our sins were imputed to Jesus. His righteousness is imputed to us. This is called justification. It gives us a right standing before God. It doesn't make us perfect in our walk, but it gives us a perfect standing before God. This is the only basis on which we can be acceptable to him. John writes, my little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is like our defensive attorney before when Satan accuses us of sin before the Father. Remember how Satan accused Job to God. Revelation 12, 10 says that it indicates that Satan accuses the saints before God day and night. A hymn some, that we sometimes sing captures the defense that we have in Christ against Satan's attack. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is gra graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ in, on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. So God has removed the enmity between us and himself by removing our sins. But he also gave us life. 
Here is how Paul describes it in Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. When, he was, when we were dead in our sins, we were unable to respond to God. In our helpless condition, God in his great love moved on in to rescue us. It sometimes is described uh, in the scripture as the new birth, as in when Peter wrote 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When God causes someone to be born again, he implants a new nature within him, a nature that can respond to God. He also seals him with the Holy Spirit, much as a king would put his seal on a letter to show the authenticity of the letter, God seals us with the Holy Spirit to show that we are authentically His. The Holy Spirit has given us as a pledge that He will redeem His own possession in the future. We might compare it to our making an earnest payment on a house as a guarantee that we will finish the purchase and claim it to be our own in the future. The Holy Spirit also opens our hearts to know the things that, that were uh, hidden from us before. James writes that in, in uh, James 1, 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first free fruits among his creatures. Notice that the new birth is an act of God's will and it's his purpose and his initiative that regenerates a person. It results in a new kind of person. John tells us that one born of God does not, uh, pra- he, that one born of God practices righteousness and that no, he no longer practices sin because God's seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This does not mean that a new creature in Christ is not capable of sinning. It means that sin is no longer his master. The present tense of the verb in these sentences would indicate that John is referring to a new practice of righteousness righteousness versus the old practice of sinning. He's not talking about a sinless life. We still live in in fallen bodies. We must, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. The love of God has designed a way for a believer in Jesus Christ to be a child of God while yet in this this imperfect mixed condition. Another aspect of the great love of God for us to consider is that he loved us long before we were born. Only an infinite God could have loved for an individual before he even comes into existence. Paul wrote that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. We find an example of God setting his love on an individual before he is born in Malachi chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 where God says to Israel, I have loved you. Israel responds, how have you loved us? God explains, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I have loved Jacob and have hated Esau. The Apostle Paul uses this same text to teach that in the present time also God has chosen those on whom he sets his love in Romans chapter 9 verses 10 through 13. Paul explains that God's choice has had nothing to do with what the twins did or what they would do or what he even knew they would do. He chose Jacob before they were born and it, was, it had nothing to do with their character either. Esau was a profane man. Jacob was a schemer. Someone has said that the marvel here is that, that 
that, that God could even love Jacob. This was so that God's purpose, according to his, his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Paul next asked the question if there is injustice in God's choosing of Jacob over Esau. Romans 9 still raises the questions in people's minds today. When I was pastor in a very small church in California, the only other elder was 15 years older than I am. And uh, he was attempting to teach Romans 9 one day. And uh, as he taught it, he was actually countering what it taught. And, uh, and he posed the question, is that fair? Is that fair? He was approaching this from the viewpoint that God is seeking to save everybody and that he's leaving the choice up to the man. In other words, you determine your response. I later had the opportunity to, to, to visit with this man and uh, I, ju I just asked him, uh, why is it that some people come to trust in Christ and others don't? And he said, well, I, I suppose it's because they're open. And I said, well, why are some people open and others are not? And he didn't know the answer. Well, we know that God is the one who opens the hearts, just as God opened the heart of Lydia, of Lydia in Philippi. When Paul was preaching, God, it says that God, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. That's in Acts 16, verse 14. It is also God who shines into satanically blinded hearts to give them light of the, uh, of the uh, gospel of the glory of Christ. In 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Paul answers the question of possible injustice with God with the response, may it never be. May not this choice of God have any injustice connected to it. There would be no... Uh, uh, th there would be no injustice in God if he didn't save anybody. But there's also no injustice if he chooses to save some. If we got justice, we would all perish. Because there's none of us that are seeking God. It is God who is seeking us. And by his grace, he drew us According to John 6, 44, in fact, Jesus said, if he doesn't draw us, nobody will come. And, uh, and then we receive eternal life when we do come. This is what is so great about God's love for us. Peter addressed Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire as those who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God's foreknowledge of us carries the idea of an intimate relationship with us. Genesis 4.1 reads that Adam, in the Hebrew it says he knew his wife. The, the NASB translates that he had relations with her. And that's, that's the right idea of knew here that it has to do with intimate relationship. And uh, she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Knew equals intimate relationship. God says in the, to the nation of Israel in Amos 3.2, you only have I known, and uh, the NASB translates, uh, you only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. He knew all about the other nations, but he only had an intimate relationship with Israel. Jesus said that many will come, will say to me in that day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Jesus will reply, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now Jesus knew all about them, but he didn't know them intimately. The words foreknowledge and foreknow speak of intimate acquaintance with someone before they were ever born. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. 
John MacArthur uh, quotes in his uh, book on the systematic summary of biblical doctrine. Therefore, the testi testimony of prognosko, and that's the gr Greek word for to foreknow, and its close cognate, gnosko, which is the Greek word for to know, uh, the, the one is to foreknow, the other is to know. The Old Testament counterpart, yada, which is the Hebrew word for to know, confirms that the sense of God's knowledge used in Romans 8, 29, speaks not of a simple uh, knowledge of facts, but rather of an intimate covenant relationship grounded on God's sovereign choice and marked by his favor and love. When Paul declares that God has foreknown individuals, he is indicating that God has determined to set his electing love and favor on them, setting them apart for an intimate, personal, saving relationship with himself. To foreknow is to forelove. Jesus described the experience of this intimacy between his disciples and the triune God in John 14, uh, 18 through 23. After Jesus' ascension, the Holy Spirit will come and indwell them forever, then they will know that as the Father and the Son are intimately related, they also are intimately related to the Son. The one loving the Son will keep his commandments, the Father and the Son will love him, and Jesus will disclose himself to him, and the Father and the Son will make their room with him, is what it says in the Greek. In other words, you will have the father and son as your roommate. It's quite a thought. Having been made children of God by his electing love and become, we become an unknown to the world. He, he says in, in uh, he says there in our, our text now, for this reason, the world does not has, does not know us because it did not know him. The world does not know God, and it does not know members of his family. Jesus informed his disciples what to expect from the world. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember that the, wor the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you for my namesake, because they do not know the one who sent me. That's John 15, verses 18 through 21. When I read these kind of things and, and I look at the condition in our country, I, I think we may be in for some more severe treatment like this by the world than what we've ever known and uh, it it what will happen will it will separate the true from the false as children of God we have come to know the truth that can only be known by revelation the the world knows only what they can know by human wisdom that's the only only source they have cannot understand the truth of God that he's made known to us. It's a reason they don't understand us. God has transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We've been, we've passed from death into life. The world is dead, the world's dead in sin and it's not any wonder that it doesn't know us because it didn't know Jesus either. We've been looking at the great love of God that calls us children of God now in the present time. We are as much children of God now as we ever will be. But John tells us that there's more in the future which doesn't presently appear. Beloved, now we are children of God and it doesn't appear as yet what we will be. We know that God, that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. John addresses these Christians as beloved. It's a term used often in scripture to address those who are on whom God has set his love. And we're, so we're beloved by God, but we also are beloved to 
those others who are elect with us. In our present state as children of God, what we will be is veiled in human frailty. Somewhat like Christ, glory was veiled by his human body when he was here on the earth. But now in glory, Jesus Christ sits at the Father's right hand in his glorified body. We don't know exactly what that glorified body looks like, but three of the disciples of Jesus saw him transfigured where it seems that some of the veil was somewhat lifted. They could see the glory of Christ. And it says that his face shone like the sun and his garments became white as light. It seems that radiance and extremely white uh, are the two the things that dis describe the glory of Christ often. Uh, that was in Matthew 17. And John received a revelation of Christ when he was uh, on the Isle of Patmos toward the end of his life. He described him as follows. His head was, and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been, been made to glow in a furnace. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When Jesus returns for his church, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Our life hidden in Christ, in, it's right now, it's hidden in Christ in God. But when he appears, he who is our life is revealed. Then you also will be revealed with him in glory. It will become what we are going to be when we see him as he is. That's in Colossians 3. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exercise of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. That's Philippians chapter 3, the last couple of verses. When God redeemed us, and adopt us, adopted us as his children, we were living in perishable mortal bodies. But these bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 50. For that reason, we are now waiting eagerly for the adoption of son, as sons. That's, that's a future adoption. There's, uh, there's a present adoption, but there's a future adoption. The, the redemption of our body. With perseverance, we eagerly wait for it, according to Romans 8, 23 and 25. When Jesus appears, the saints who have, been, who have died will be resurrected with imperishable, immortal bodies. And the saints who are living at that time will be changed in a moment. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. All of this is from 1 Corinthians 15. We will not fail, God will not fail in his purpose for each and every person for whom, whom he foreknew. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also glorified, or I'm sorry, justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, 29 to 30. Our glorification is so certain that he speaks of it as though it had already been accomplished. Such is the great love of God for those whom he foreknew. Let's think a bit about the statement that we will see him as he is. When Jesus was on the earth, his glory was veiled in human flesh. The disciples could see him. They could touch him. They were with him. But when he returns... He will come in full glory. We'll see him just as he is. Remember God's word to Moses. When Moses asked if, to see the glory of God, that's in Exodus 33, God said to him, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. While sinful man could not see Jesus in his full glory and live, when we are glorified, we can look at him because we will be like him. 
Jesus prayed just before he went to the cross about his desire for his disciples. This is in John 17. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus' desire is that we may see his glory. Finally, John says regarding the hope that we have of seeing Jesus and being like him, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. This hope is not subjective as when someone says, I really hope things will turn out okay. This is a, an objective hope. It's based solidly on the death and resurrection of Christ, and it's based on the promise that he has made that we will see him and be like him. It's a certain hope. And the one that has this hope is preparing himself for the prospect of seeing Jesus and of being like him. How does one prepare himself? He purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. And notice that this isn't stated as an imperative. It's stated, it's a statement. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. It's, it's a, the outcome of having such a hope. Peter also first admonishes Christians, and, and, and the idea here is that, that before you can really purify yourself, before you can really obey commandments, you need to know truth. And that's a scriptural pattern. Uh, doctrine is taught, and then practical uh, walking is taught. Peter follows that same thing when he says, therefore, Prepare your minds for action and keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice he's first of all saying, fix your hope on that return of Jesus Christ. Then, as, then he talks about holiness. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which you had in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Likewise, Paul first directs be, uh, believers to keep seeking those things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on the earth, in Colossians 3. And then, because of your identification with Christ in his death, and in light of the hope of his re the revelation of Jesus Christ, he admonishes them to holy living. And he writes in first in uh, Colossians 3, yet, therefore consider the members of your earthly body dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Paul says that it is as we are beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord that we are being transformed into the same image in 2 Corinthians 3.18. A common pattern throughout the epistles is this pattern. First, information. Second, admonition. If we were to be given the commandments without the truth, without the uh, the, the uh, doctrine, it would become burdensome for us to obey. But John says that the love of God changes all that. He writes, for it is, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his b b commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5, 3. Consider the, these encouragements to purify yourself, Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Matthew 5, 8. And as King David asked God to search him 
See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. That's in Psalm 139, the last two verses. And then the writer of Hebrews writes, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification. That's the holiness. That's what we're talking about here, purification, without which no one will see the Lord. Jonathan Edwards, in his sermon entitled The Way of Holiness, said, None but those who are in the way of holiness will, will be in heaven. He indicated that there is nothing more necessary for the Christian to pursue than to pursue holiness. A person without holiness would be completely out of place in heaven. When we pursue holiness, we're pursuing that which characterizes God and that to which God has destined his elect. In closing, we would, we'll look at a few other passages on the love of God. The first one shows that the love of God initiates our love. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. It obligates us to love one another, according to 1 John 4, 11. And then Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another, John 13, 34. This, this is really a step up from what the law teaches, love your neighbor as yourself. Love as I have loved you. This kind of love is made possible for us because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 1 John 4, 7 through 8 shows that the implications of the love of God in our lives, it could even be said that it's a test of whether you're saved or not. He writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God and Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The prophet Micah writes of God's unchanging love for Israel in the future restoration when he says, Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. The love of God brings discipline to those who are his. Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. He disciplines us for our good, according to Hebrews 12, so that we may share in his holiness. Paul prayed that the saints would be rooted and grounded in love and that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge. To know something that surpasses knowledge. Jude admonishes Christians to keep themselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. I was thinking, how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Well, he also talks about building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Um, we, we've got resources to keep yourself in the love of God. As I read through the Old Testament, I see a, it's a, an amazing love of God for his people, his ancient people, Israel. I'm impressed that he persists in his plan for Israel through all of their sin. And he says, ever since you came out of Egypt, you've been a rebellious people. And he still continues with his purpose to bring his Messiah through them, to bring them into glory. He, uh, at, at one point, even... Uh, they had to go into captivity, but he, he, he kept his purpose. He kept to his purpose through all of that. Even after they came back out of captivity, the line promised to David that his son would, the Messiah would be born in his line was still, still took place after they came back into the land after the, uh, the captivity. And then Israel again rejected their Messiah so that even today they are an unbelieving people. 
as a, as a nation. There are individuals who are, who are believers, but as a nation they are unbelieving. But they still have that promise, that new covenant promise for in, Isaiah, in Jeremiah 31, that I will put a new heart in them, I will make them new. And Paul tells us in uh, Romans uh, chapter 11 that he, he says, uh, he says, all Israel will be saved just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Now, now Paul's writing this after the new covenant period has begun for, for us, but it hasn't begun for the nation Israel. It's still future. And Paul's writing, it's still going to happen. He even quotes from Jeremiah in that passage. Well, Jeremiah, in that passage, in, in his 31st chapter in his book, uh, it talks about the new covenant toward the end of the chapter, but in the very beginning of that chapter, he, he writes about the love of God for his ancient people. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. A man named George Robinson captured the thought of this verse from Jeremiah when he wrote in the late 1800s, this, I'm just going to read some passages from his song that he wrote. It, it's a loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know, gracious spirit from above, thou hast taught me it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace, oh, this transport all divine, in a love which cannot cease, I am his and he is mine. Taste the goodness of the Lord, welcomed home, welcomed home to his embrace. All his love as blood outpoured seals the pardon of his grace. Can I doubt his love for me when I trace that love design? By the cross of Calvary I am his and he is mine. His forever, only his. Who the Lord and me shall part? All with what a rest of bliss Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade away, Firstborn light in gloom decline. But God, while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. Paul, near the end of Romans 8, after writing that great passage which traces God's plan from his foreknowledge of us through his glorification of us, writes, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us? Then he asked, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He answers, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If no created thing can separate you from God's love, and if the one who is uncreated is for you and has planned your future and his plans cannot be thwarted, how safe you are in the love of God. Let us pray. You know, we have a, just a little bit of time before I pray. Let, let me uh, see if there's any questions or comments that anyone w would like to make it this time uh, and that's fine if you don't we can quit early okay all right let's pray father we we thank you that you've manifested your love in your son we thank you that you gave us your that you gave us your love 
And we thank you that your love selected us and that you poured out your love into our hearts by the Spirit whom you have given us. May we grow in the grace and knowledge of yourself and in the practice of your love and above all of it. May we not forget the great your greatness, the greatness of your love and the smallness of ourselves that we may truly glorify you, that we may desire above all else that you be glorified, that you be glorified in our lives, that you be glorified in our church, that you be glorified in each uh, function of the church and that young people will come to know you and that people around us may be, with, may, may be brought to you through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.